Good afternoon, Thanks. everyone. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm Eileen McClellan. I'm lead senior scientist with Environmental Defense Fund, EDF. And I'm going to talk today about work that we did in partnership with Two Degrees Adapt to try to answer the question, can we climate proof US agriculture? What are the challenges and opportunities for growing food on a warming planet? Our colleague Deepak Ray uh, published now almost a decade ago this analysis of historic yield trends in the major crops, maize, rice, wheat, and soybean, shown here in different colors. For each crop, the dots represent the historic yields. And if we imagine for any crop, connecting those dots into an average straight line and extending that into the future, we get the solid lines shown on this diagram. That is the projected future yields if current trends continue. He then added to the diagram what yields would need to be in order to double production by 2050. At the time, this was an estimate of what would be needed in order to feed the world population anticipated in 2050. What's worrying is that for each of these cases, the dashed line lies above the solid line, meaning that for each of these crops, even if current trends in yield increases continue, it won't be sufficient to meet the food production needs of a growing population. This was in the days before we started to think much about climate change. It's already a struggle. So we wanted to ask the question, what happens to this if the planet warms? Our approach begins with two fundamental bits of science. One related to global climate models, which give us predictions of future climates. And we downscaled these to a scale of four kilometers by four kilometers. That's a bit smaller than a US county and a bit bigger than the typical US farm to make it more relevant to farmers. From these climate models, we get important climate data like temper daily temperature, daily rainfall, and we fed this into crop growth models in order to predict future crop yields under climate change. A bit more on the downscale climate models, we used a standard US government data set. You can see the website here. We made optimistic assumptions about future greenhouse gas emissions. We used a range of 20 different models to capture the range in climate projections that different scientists have come up with. And as I say, we downscaled all of this to that four kilometer, four kilometer hyperlocal scale to be more meaningful. We also developed crop models to predict future yields. We used 40 years of historical observations, county scale crop yields reported to USDA to do two things. First, to identify the aspects of climate most important to crop yields. For corn and soybeans, we found that was growing degree days and killing degree days. Growing degree days are a measure of the accumulated warmth that's needed to get the crop to grow and reproduce. Killing degree days are a measure of extreme heat time spent in temperatures at which the crop stops to grow and in fact begins to die. For wheat, we found that these killing degree days were very important. Remember, wheat is a winter crop and so very heat sensitive. But we also found that fall freeze days and spring rainfall were critical to yields. The other thing we used this data to do was to quantify the impact on yields of improved management and technology to say, if we imagine that uh, management and technology continues to improve over time, how would this contribute to future yields? We tested our crop models against 40 years of historical data, 1981 to 2020. And then we used the crop models to predict future yields with and without climate change through 2060. This is an example of the data that we produced. This is for Tama County, Iowa, and it shows on the vertical axis corn yield in bushels per acre and the horizontal axis time in decades out to 2060. The squiggly blue line represents the historic data on yields in this county. We've smoothed that out, we've averaged that out to produce the yellow-orange looking line. Uh, 
And we've extrapolated it forwards from 2020 to 2060. This tells us the predicted yields, assuming we continue to improve management and technology without climate change. We then took the important factors of climate, remember for corn, it was killing degree days and growing degree days, and we fed that into our corn crop growth model, and that produced the squiggly black line that you see. So the squiggly black line is predicted yields still with improved management and technology, but now accounting for the impacts of climate change. What you see is that going forward and increasingly important as we get out to 2050 and beyond, the yields under climate change are much lower than they are without climate change. We call this a climate impact or a climate burden on yields. So we did this kind of analysis for soybeans in Minnesota, corn in Iowa, and wheat in Kansas. And here's what we found. For Iowa corn, the impacts are substantial. By 2030, across the state, we predict a climate impact of about 18 bushels per acre. And that grows by 2050 to about 34 bushels per acre. So these are bushels per acre less than we would expect without climate change. We see some impacts, though smaller, for Minnesota soybean. And for Kansas winter wheat, the impact seems very low, but in fact, it's very variable across the state, even though the average doesn't change very much. We can see this illustrated in this map of Iowa, in which the counties are shaded in according to the climate impact or climate burden on yield, this time as a percentage change. And we see that by 2030, for all counties in Iowa, all counties are going to experience at least a 5% climate burden, and about half of Iowa counties are going to experience at least a 10% climate burden. By 2050, all Iowa counties are going to experience a 25% climate impact, and many counties, especially in the south, are going to be experiencing a 25% or greater climate impact. So we wanted to think about what this means and what we could do about it. We started by comparing our predicted crop yields to predicted food production needs. We also looked at the economic impact of climate-induced changes in crop yields, and we identified adaptation approaches to minimize climate impacts. This is a variant of the Tama County diagram that we saw before, with corn yield on the vertical axis and time, decades, on the horizontal axis. The solid yellow line represents the historic trend in crop yields. The dashed yellow line represents that same trend projected into the future. That is what yields will look like without climate change, but with continued investment in technology and adaptation. The jagged blue line represents the yields that we predict to occur without, with climate change. And you see that blue line is always below the yellow line. There's an X on there, which may not be very visible. So let's make it more visible. It's, now it's a black star. Now, if this particular county, Tama County, Iowa, was in 2050 to contribute the same share to global food production as it does now, this is what yields would need to be. In other words, if right now, Corn from Tama County is, let's say, 1% of global food production. If it's still to be 1% of global food production in 2050, the star tells us what the yields would need to be. The star is below the yellow dashed line. So without climate change, we could do this. But it's above the wiggly blue line. So once we factor in climate change, it's really going to be difficult for us to meet food production goals. Now, all of these projections assume continued investment in management and technology. 
but sadly, that is not guaranteed. U.S. investment in agricultural research and development has declined considerably in the past few years. If it were to completely flatten, well, yields would stay where they are today. That's what we show with the green line. And we assume it's not going to be that bad. But yields, realistically, are probably going to be somewhere between the jagged blue line, the effect of climate, and the green line, the lack of investment in agricultural R&D. So I think we're looking at real problems. Even if managed, we'll forget that bit. We now look at the economic impact. So we decided to look at the impact on net income by county on wheat production in Kansas. <coughs> Excuse me. So the green and dark blue colors represent counties where net income is likely to increase, and the orange and darker orange counties are counties where net income is projected to decrease. And you see this is a map of winners and losers. We see in southern and eastern Kansas a number of counties where net income is expected to go up under those warmer conditions. But we also see, especially in northern and western Kansas, which is drier and will be hotter, a number of counties where net income will go down, as much as $4 million or more per year per county. The other thing we see, which is going to make this very challenging, is we have some places where dark orange counties are next to dark blue counties. That is, climate winners are right next to climate losers. And this makes for a real problem in terms of policy responses. We can't write a national policy. We can't even write a state level policy. We need really spatially fine scale policies to address these challenges. The good news is that there's stuff we can do. Adaptation will reduce some of the climate burden and there's a wide range, a broad spectrum of adaptation opportunities that they can choose from. We show some of these in this diagram. On the vertical axis, we show the scale of change, going in spatial scale from the plant scale to the landscape. You can think of this also as being an increasing scale of investment, of time needed to make the change, and of difficulty of switching from the current crop production system to a new one. So these changes, these adaptations, range from the incremental at the plant scale to the transformational at the landscape scale. At the plant scale, we know there's a lot we can do with crop breeding, whether this is genetic modification, genetic editing like CRISPR, or a new genome-enabled hybrid varieties of the same crop. At the field scale, there's things we can do with soil health practices like cover crops and no-till. And we can also use precision agriculture, better management of fertilizers and water to increase yield with reduced inputs of those resources. At the farm scale, we can start to think about diversifying either a different crop mix or extended rotations. And we can do the same at the landscape scale, diversifying the crops, and in some cases, even deciding to shift crop production from one part of a region to another to keep up with changing climates. The challenge before us is understanding how much adaptation benefit each of these options will provide relative to what will be needed in other words, is incremental change enough or will transformational change be needed? We need to be able to tailor these options to individual farms and different regions. And we need to secure the public and private support, both dollars and technical support, that will be needed to help farmers transition to a better future. You can download our report at this website, www.edf.org slash climateproofingagriculture. It's quite long, but we've got an executive summary up front. We also have some story maps there where you can click on a county you're interested in and get more information on climate impacts. 
So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I'm not in the room to talk with you all, but please send any questions or comments to me at this address, emcclellan at edf.org. Thank you all.